Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for today's webinar, Searching the Catalog. This webinar is for all Evergreen Indiana staff who want to learn how the catalog is set up, how it functions, and how to use it to your advantage. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat and I will get to them as soon as I see them. There are a lot of functions in the catalog that pertain to specific staff types, uh, catalogers or circulation who handle holds, for example. We're not gonna dive into those parts, but we will briefly mention them because it is important to see all there is to the catalog. My name is Britta Dorsey. I am the Development Support Administrator for Evergreen Indiana. If you ever have any questions, whether it's in regards to this presentation, other presentations, things you would like to see in the future that you haven't seen before, um, or just questions, comments, concerns about Evergreen Indiana in general, please do not hesitate to contact me, uh, my email or phone, um, and I will respond as soon as I am able. For the agenda today, we are covering um, a couple of the more like niche terminology you will hear during this presentation. Of course, we're going to cover the staff catalog and all of its glory and the baskets function. And as I mentioned before, we won't be covering holds or the patron catalog. Um, if you are interested in learning more about those, there are um, other webinars specifically for those. Uh, please go ahead and check the evergreenindiana.org calendar for more details or check our YouTube training channel to see if the most recent recordings have been uploaded. Let's go over some terminology uh, that we use um, in the catalog. And to be honest, they are primarily cataloging terms, but I think it's helpful um, for everyone to understand how, what they do or how they, um, what actions they perform in the catalog or how they work with it. Regardless of what your position is at your library, if you are working with the catalog, it really is useful to know these terms. At the highest level, we have the bibliographic record, which is what the catalog is made up of. We have millions of records representing various formats and editions of titles new and old. We have bibliographic records for playaways, kits, cake pans, and even tool sets. This is what we and the patrons search for when looking through the catalog. And it represents all of these different listed items as a whole. The MARC record, which stands for Machine Readable Catalog or Cataloging, is what the computer reads and translates to put that specific item's description into a more user-friendly format. Many aspects of our search filters and format information is actually taken from the MARC record. And this is where uh, subject headings, authors, and physical descriptions are pulled from. Next within a library's branch is the call number. You'll hear me use the terms call number in volume interchangeably as both terms have actually been used in Evergreen. These are the, this is the container in which an item or multiple items sit. They are special to each library and is one of the first ways we can tell where an item is located in the library. Within each call number sits an item um, or sometimes referred to as a copy. While the call number can represent multiple copies of the same item, a barcode is specific for an individual item. So if you have three copies of the new Prince Harry book, they may share the same call number, but each will have its own barcode. A part is what can distinguish elements from the whole. If your library circulates TV series, for example, but each disc can be checked out separately or a variation of that, a part will mark that item as different. They can also distinguish between different volumes of a set of books like encyclopedias. These are what allow patrons to request those specific issues of a magazine or disc one and two of a season in house. The smallest part of what makes an item tick in the catalog is the circulation modifier. This is what defines the item's circulation terms, uh, fines, if it's holdable, if it transits, um, the cost of the item, and more. When we say the staff catalog, we mean the catalog we as library staff access through the web client. 
Um, it is the same catalog that patrons access via the OPAC, but I mean, it's still visually different, but it's still, we are still looking at the same items. Facets you will hear me talk about later. These will are what appear on the left side um, after a keyword search. These allow um, list aspects found in the resulting records to help us narrow down our results because we know sometimes searches in the catalog can be really broad. So to access the catalog, there are a couple ways to do that. Um, there is a basic keyword search available on the homepage. Um, the advanced search below that will open the full catalog search interface with the option to do a number of search types and apply filters. You can also access advanced catalog search or just the staff catalog is another term for that uh, from the search and cataloging top nav menu options. But regardless of which search you start with though, it's going, those links are going to take you to the staff catalog. The catalog looks pretty bare when it first loads. You can see there are several tabs with what seem like different search functions, a single search field, and some other options to be able to sort and organize your results. We then move to the right of the screen where we can change what library or org unit we are searching. Then below that, there are some other interesting functions of the catalog that we will talk about later. But before we perform any searches in the catalog, it's a great idea to set our search preferences. You can access the search preferences function from any screen in the staff catalog. It's available below the search templates button. Clicking on it is going to open the preferences within this area of the catalog. Uh, just a quick reminder that any search preferences set are going to be saved at the workstation level, not the user level. So if you log in at different computers that have different workstations registered, you will need to set these at each workstation. So your first option is the default search library. Besides being the default library search for the staff catalog, it's also going to be the default for the basic keyword search, which is available on the portal page. We always recommend setting it at the highest level, which is EGIN or the consortium level. This can be manually overridden if you change it while performing a search. Um, this is just a recommendation. You really can just set it to whatever works best for you and your library. Uh, whatever system or branch you select for your preferred library is what will show copy information on each search result, regardless of the actual library searched. Uh, we'll go over a little bit more on what I mean when we talk about how to uh, translate search results. The default search pane is what designates the type of search you want to pop up when you first access the staff catalog. I recommend selecting the option uh, from the drop down menu that you will use most often in your primary workflow. It's really easy to switch between them uh, when you open the catalog, but this is what's going to appear first. Search results per page just allows you to um, change how many re results you see per page. The default without putting anything in this field is 10, um, but you can make it however large or small you want. Check marking this exclude electronic resources button does not actually exclude electronic uh, resources from your search results. It just makes the option available to you with the other search filters to exclude those resources. When you have finished selecting your search preferences, you can either scroll up to the back to the top of the page to begin a new search or click the return button to go back to the page you were on, whether it was search results or a record summary page. And all of these changes, as you change them on the page, they are automatically going to save. So there's no save button um, to expect. All right, so the search library or the library org unit selector, this allows us to filter by the library for all of the search types in Evergreen. 
what appears in this library selector automatically is what you set as default within those search preferences that we just looked at. And even if it is default, we can modify it on the fly. We just click the, um, the field right here and it will show the drop down. We can just scroll through to find the library we wish to select. It is in alphabetic order. Or you can just start typing in your library short name and it will, should, appear, start appearing so you can um, just find it even faster. So what kind of searches can we perform in the staff catalog? Numeric search is useful when you know the exact item you wish to search for and know the specified query type to search with. You can search a specific ISBN, UPC, ISSN, a Library Congress control number, um, a title control number, which is specific to each record in the catalog, or you can also uh, search a specific item's barcode. It's really nice to use when you know what you're looking for, and so you don't have to worry about all of those extra fil fields and filters. Anyone can use it as long as you have that specific um, number, like the, the specific ISBN for that, for that edition or a specific UPC for that DVD. Um, you'll most likely have searched for the ISBN online or have the item physically in your hand. And there are other easier ways to search for these particular value types in Evergreen. You can use the keyword search to search for um, most of the options, the ISBN, UPC, etc. The title control number is there, it is searchable by using a different function that is available to catalogers who are the ones that use this the most. And item status is almost always the best way uh, when you are dealing with specific item barcodes. So how it works. To use numeric search, we want to select a query type from the dropdown, and then we will enter the corresponding value in the value field. In this example, we are searching for a specific ISBN, and then our next step is to search. Your search results will appear below, and because you are searching for a specific value, there should only be a limited number of results. You can see in this example that the ISBN is highlighted because it is a, it is a match to our search uh, value. All right, let's take a look at the numeric search in action. So I'm going to access the staff catalog by clicking search the catalog, and we're gonna go to numeric search. Okay, I'm gonna continue using this example because I think it's, it's a great example. So I, have in the past, I uh, was looking for a specific edition of the Count of Monte Cristo because after uh, it, I heard that it was the um, the copy that I was looking for, which is the Penguin Classics edition translated by Robin Buss, um, I heard that it was the best French to English translation. So I wanted to make sure I read the um, the edition that was the closest to the original publication. Um, there are currently 74 records in the catalog for the Counts of Monte Cristo. So to make it a little easier on myself to find that specific edition, I googled the, I, <clears throat> excuse me, googled the ISBN. And now that I have it, I can search for it in our catalog using the numeric search. So we are going to use that to search for this ISBN. So I've just copied the ISBN. I have ISBN selected. I think it's selected by default because it's at the top of the list. I'm going to enter the value and then click search. So the result that pops up, as you can see with the highlighted ISBNs, should be the exact copy I am looking for. We can also see uh, the publication information is showing Penguin Books, which is what we want. And we're gonna cover how to actually look more about these results later, but we can assume based on at least just looking at the ISBN that this is the uh, specific edition that I want. Uh, so now I can see if there's a copy available at my library, uh, if I can, I can see if I can find it on the shelf, or I will see if I can request it from another Evergreen library to transit to me. 
The next search type we're going to look at is a mark search. The mark search allows you to search for a particular field or even a particular subfield in a mark record. This can be very useful when trying to search for something with specific subjects and catalogers could use it to find records that need to be fixed. Anyone can use it, but they will need to know about authorized headings or at least the proper format of those headings if they're looking for a particular subject heading, genre, or personal name like the author's name, which is usually in the format of surname first. You'll also need to be familiar with MARC tags and what they stand for, and only the records with your tag and particular field will appear in the results. So if you search for mystery fiction, but only 12 out of the, how many are there now, 29 Stephanie Plum books show up in your results, it's likely that those other books don't have that specific headings. Um, also, your results may also, uh, just end up being too broad. So when we're in MARC search, we're going to enter the field we want to appear in the MARC record of the bibliographic record. The subfield is optional, but highly recommended as it will also help narrow down your results. Enter the value you are looking for and then click search. For this example, we are looking for movies that have been awarded or nominated for an Academy Award. For our first search, we have over 1,000 results, and that's a lot to go through, so let's narrow it down a little more. We are going to add a second tag uh, using the plus button next to the first field. So we add a second field for, and we are looking for Academy Award movies with Tom Hanks. So I enter a 700 for the tag and the value of Tom Hanks. Um, and then click search. And now we've narrowed down the results to only 10. And you can tell by at least the first, the cover art, that it is a Tom Hanks movie. So if you want to go even farther, you can double check the mark record for uh, to make sure there is an Academy Award uh, information listed. Um, so the mark search really can be useful, um, but again, only for those who are familiar with mark records. All right, let's take a look at mark search. So I mentioned Stephanie Plum earlier. I'm just gonna reset and go to mark search. So um, in our mark records, we put series uh, like official series titles in an 800 field. So I'm going to enter 800. Uh, the title is usually in a subfield T. So I'm just going to enter Stephanie Plum to see if I can find um, the books that are part of that series. And it doesn't have to be exact. It's just going to look inside that subfield for these values. So whether we enter Stephanie Plum or Plum Novel, we should get the same search results. So after pressing enter, we have over 200 results. And this will include all format types available in the catalog, unless we were to use other tags in the MARC record to narrow it down. All right, let's take a look at the browse function in the catalog. Browse the catalog is useful because it allows you to browse headings available in the catalog. Um, we use it because it allows us to see what other headings are available in the catalog that would fall before and after um, our search query. Uh, pros of this is that it will allow us to maybe see titles or uh, similar headings that we may not have thought of to search for. Um, however, the problem, one of the problems with the browse function is that we cannot exclude e-resources, which may, will probably not be a problem once we uh, load Aspen. But, and also, um, but another con is that our results may just be way too broad. So in this example, I browsed for the author Stephen King. 
um, I actually edited these results so you could um, actually see one of the more of the Stephen King options. Um, so you can see that there are results for authors other than Stephen King. And when we, if we were to click on one, say this King comma Stephen, it's going to take us to those results. From there, we can narrow down the search a little more or browse the results we are given. What also appears are the previous heading and next heading buttons that allow you to go through the other headings that popped up in your results. All right, let's do a browse search. I'm going to do a subject search of Library of Things and um, capitalization doesn't matter. It's not um, case sensitive. And a heads up, uh, browse is usually a pretty slow uh, search. All right, so we have our results that start with Library of Congress, which isn't really what we actually searched for, but it's just, it's showing us the headings that come before our, uh, our query. And then if we come down, we could also, we now get to our Library of Things. Uh, we, have, we have two different ones. We have Library of Things with uh, capital letters and just sentence case library of things here. So if we were to click, I'm gonna click the smaller one because it'll load faster. It's going to uh, bring up those records with that specific uh, subject heading. So it could be a great way to, uh, to see what other records are in there and might find something that you didn't think you wanted. Next to last is the shelf browse function. Shelf Browse searches the catalog much like the Browse function, except instead of searching within the bib records in the catalog, it searches through the call numbers that are on those bib records that are owned by the libraries that have copies. It also shows your results that fall before and after your query. I like to think of it as like a virtual version of walking through the stacks, kind of just looking at the books and seeing what falls before and after. Um, I don't, though, uh, feel like it would be good to use if you were looking for something specific. So in this example, we are going to narrow down our search to just Thorntown by selecting their short name from the library selector dropdown. And I want to browse around the call number FIC ROB. When I click search, the results appear below. The actual call number you search for will be highlighted in blue. And then you'll see some titles that fall before and then after based on the call number we entered. If we click on the result, um, it's going to take us to that specific bib record. Okay, let's take a look at shelf browse. This one I also wanted to do um, library of things. I'm gonna do this in all caps, click search. So we can see uh, headings or call numbers that are appearing before Library of Things. But then we also, our first one, Library of Things, is highlighted in blue. We can see now we have another one, Telescope, Portable, DC, AC, Air Compressor. That's actually pretty cool. Um, and some others. We can use the Next and Back buttons to search through those. Um, so if you know that libraries enter like library of things into their call numbers, this could be a great way to see um, what is available across the consortium. It also depends um, if you like narrow down your results. So let's see Kendallville. Let's go down here and see library of things. So we see those that fall before that. Here we go. So we have so now we're getting into Kendallville's Library of Things shelf based on what they enter in their call number. So you can find some really interesting things here. Okay. All right, let's go back to keyword search. I consider this the primary form of searching in Evergreen. It's a really easy way to create a super broad search or narrow it down to just a single title. 
It can search anything we'd wish to search using the other search options, excluding the shelf browse though. So what is a keyword search? Keyword search lets you search the catalog using various filters, operators, and multiple fields. We use it because it allows us to um, use various options to make a as broad of a search or as narrow of a search that we want. If you're browsing, you might even find related material that you weren't even looking for. You can also search for a specific author like Rick Riordan and still pull up the results you're looking for. And you're not, because you're not necessarily limited by how the name is entered. Everyone can and should use it because it's a powerful tool in the catalog. One of the downsides maybe is it might not be the fastest way to find the search results if you're in a hurry uh, because there are so many options to choose from. The first thing you want to do or you want to look at is do you want to narrow down your search by format? Are you only looking for the audiobook format for titles by Jennifer Lynn Barnes? Do you want to see if there is an ebook version of A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik? And so on and so on. You can choose to search all movies and televisions, uh, shows, or break it down to only Blu rays or DVDs. Narrow down your search to Playways or a read along version of a children's book. This is going to probably be the easiest way to immediately narrow down your search, by, uh, especially by format. A search type allows you to choose where you want your query to be searched in the MARC record. Do you want it to search for the title, a uh, specific author or name in the record, a subject or series name? You can also search for a journal title, digital book play, or just a general keyword. This is optional as you can enter everything into the keyword search type. It just might not search as precisely and give you more than what you're looking for. For example, if you did a keyword search on the Hunger Games, it would bring up the title by Suzanne Collins, of course, but it will also bring up any record that mentions hunger or games. You'd get over 200 results in a keyword search instead of maybe just 80 if you were to do a title and author search. Uh, the same goes uh, for an author search. If you do a keyword search for Stephen King, Sands Electronic Resources, you get results numbering in the couple thousand. But if you do an author search, you'll only get about 1,100. Those numbers still sound really difficult to sift through, which is why we can combine that specific format, type, and other search options to bring down our search results to a more manageable number. Uh, we can expand or limit our results more by using other types of search criteria. These are those contains, does not contain, matches exactly, and starts with options. Contains is the default choice when you start a search. You may notice if you have the keyword search type selected that matches exactly and starts with criteria options are grayed out. They are available with all of the other search types though. And these will allow you to narrow or broaden your search even more. We know that some authors share the same name and many book titles share the same title. How can we narrow down the search? We can add more input fields and search uh, with multiple types. The plus and minus signs at the end of the input field allow us to add or remove extra input fields. So if we click the plus button, we'll get a second input field. I don't believe um, there is a coded limit to how many you can add on, but I will tell you if you try to uh, include three or more um, or anything after three, like key, especially all of them keyword searches, um, the catalog will sort of break a little. Uh, so pr I would recommend probably sticking with at least or a maximum of two. And then you can use the other like facets to help narrow down from there. Uh, when you add a new row, you uh, get the option to select and or or to shape what results you'll see. And will show both the title and author together, which is a pretty narrow search. Or will show the title, author, or title and author, which is very broad. 
Now these next several search options can be done prior to a search being done or after you've done your initial search. We can sort our results uh, to list by title, author, publication date, or popularity. By default, uh, Evergreen sorts results by relevance, uh, by default, or give or take. We aren't actually 100% sure on how this is set up, if I'm being completely honest. If you check mark limit to available, it will limit results to those that have items that are in either available or reshelving status. It could be that all but one holding on a record is checked out, but since that one item is available, it is going to show up in your results. If a patron is in need of a specific title and doesn't really care what format's in, whether it's like just between regular print and large print or in even an audiobook version, or if there are a bunch of the same format records with various amounts of available copies, it might be a good idea to use the Group Formats Editions option. This will allow a hold, or more specifically a meta hold, to be placed across multiple records to find the first available copy. It could also be used to help clean up your search results. Let's use Diana Gabaldon's Outlander series as the example. There are print books, regular and large print, audiobooks, ebooks, e audiobooks, a television series, and companion books and novellas. It's a very large world that this author has built. If we group formats editions together for an author search that matches Gabaldon, Diana exactly, we're going to get 49 results. If we didn't use the grouping function, we could get over 170. If you check mark um, results from all libraries, it's going to bypass any preferences set, preferences set for the workstation if the default search library is anything other than at the consortium level or the EGIN. So let's say we're searching Thorntown's holding for material with Diana Gabaldon as an author. In this example, we see there are 82 results. But if we check mark results from all libraries, we can see that the results amount uh, has jumped to 178 without having to have changed our default library. It could be considered an easier way to search all of Evergreen without actually changing the search library. Also, just a reminder, just because we change our search library in the available box, it's not going to actually change our default search library we set in preferences. If we leave the catalog and come back later, it's going to have reverted to our saved default. Now, I don't know about you, but I normally don't search for e-resources from the staff catalog. And because of that, I really love the exclude electronic resources button. Unlike the button we checked when we set our search preferences, this one actually excludes those e-resources from your search results. Let's take Colleen Hoover as the example for this. If we just do a basic author search with her name, we are going to get 147 results, which is a mix of print, audio, and electronic resources. But if we check mark that exclude electronic resources button and then click search again, it's going to narrow down our results list just to 87. And then we don't have to pass over all of those empty e-resource records. The point I'm trying to show you with all of these options is that there's you can use a mix of them and they are extremely useful and in organizing and making our search results as broad or as narrow as we want. And there are even more ways to refine your search to find what you're looking for. Search filters, except for the shelving location, pull their information directly from the MARC record. And remember from before that MARC records are what describe the content and physical attributes of an item in a way the computer can translate into a readable person-friendly format. The shelving location list will change based on what you have selected for your search library uh, from the library selector or also your default search library. Uh, the filters you are probably most likely to use are language, 
audience, uh, shelving location, if you're searching a specific library, and maybe literary form. The formats filter in the search input field will help narrow down your results to the specific format you need. Uh, to view these filters, we just click on this vertical ellipses here at the end of an input field, and they will appear here at the bottom. Uh, if you want to select a specific, uh, let's say, language, you can use uh, find, let's say you're looking for Spanish titles, you can scroll down and select the, um, the language, the Spanish that you are looking for. If you want to select multiple options, um, you can hold down the control button on your keyboard while you click so you can select or so you can search through both adolescent and general audience um, titles. If we want to sort of start from scratch in our searching, we can click the reset button. This is going to clear previous search results and most of these search, search settings. These uh, checkable options though will stick. The publication year can be limited to a specific year, before or after a specific year, or even between years. Between year searches um, include results for the years entered and the years that fall between them. So in this image, your results will show anything that was published based on the MARC record in 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 2009. So if you're like me and perform a number of searches in succession, but then remember something you forgot to do in a result from a previous search, so you perform a brand new search of the same search you did not too long ago, you end up performing a lot of searches. Well, as those infomercials like to say, there's a better way. So to start off, recent searches will save all of your searches while logged in to the web client. They will disappear as soon as you log out. To view your recent searches, click on the recent searches dropdown. Uh, it is below the search library field. It's only going to show what you entered in the top input field, regardless of how many other fields you used for each search, like if you used a uh, title input and an author. It's only going to show title if that was the one um, at the top. And it's only going to show the last 10 searches you performed. As soon as you click one, it's going to perform that search again. And to clear your recent searches, you can log out of the web client or click the clear re recent uh, searches uh, button. Sort of similar to holdings templates, if you use specific search options time and time again, it might be beneficial to utilize the search templates. To create a template or to set one up, you will want to select the search options you will most commonly use for that specific search, as well as any other input fields. Um, just a heads up, but the templates right now will not save filter choices um, or any of these clickable options. When you are finished setting up your fields, you will click on search templates and then click save template. You'll be asked to enter a name for your template, press save when you have figure one out. So now if you click on search templates, your template, your new template will be listed. If a template is bold, that means that is the one you are currently viewing or you last selected. To delete a single template, you will need to select it first from the list um, and then go back to the search template menu and then select delete selected. It's immediately going to remove that template from the list. If you want to delete all of the templates, you don't have to select a template first. Uh, you will click uh, the search templates and then delete all templates. It will ask if you are sure you want to delete them all. And if you click confirm, it's going to delete all of them. If you click cancel, your templates will stay. All right, we've performed a keyword search in the catalog. Now we need to understand what we are looking at as a result. 
Once you've performed a search, your results will appear below the search input fields. You'll see the total number of results retrieved based on that input and other filters, linked facets, and the results themselves. Um, the results themselves are usually separated uh, into gray blocks. You will also notice that if the term you searched uh, is by is visible in the results, it's going to be highlighted. So you can see here that I searched by name. So I searched for uh, Schwab Victoria. And each result has quite a bit of information, including cover art, a brief physical summary of the item, the number of holdings, number of holds, and other record information. The physical summary includes the title and author, an icon that denotes the specific record's format, a call number from one of the holdings on that item, a uh, pagination, edition statement, uh, publisher information, and identifying information like the ISBN or UPC. And except for this call number, all of this information is taken from various fields in the MARC record. To the right of the physical description is a quick view of the holding count. Uh, you can see in this example that there are 16 holdings at the consortium level, so across all library systems, um, that have a status of available or reshelving. 186 is the total number of items on the record at the consortium level. The consortium total will always show regardless of search filters used and preferences set. Other libraries holdings uh, may be visible based on your search preferences and filters. For example, I used Adams Decatur as a search filter, but my preferred library is still set to Thorntown. So in our results, we're going to see three holdings details for each of these results. Um, if we were to change the filter back to Evergreen or the consortium or just to Thorntown, you would only see the consortium level holdings and Thorntown if there are any. To the right of the holding summary is the title control number or TCN, uh, the total number of holds on that specific record. And this does include all holds, whether they are suspended on, already on the hold shelf or in transit who the record was created or imported by, and who last edited the record. You also have the ability to place a hold from the place hold button. The show more details button will expand the brief summary of each search result. Um, if you have your preferred library set, their holdings, if there are any on that record, will appear at the top of the list. Um, and then below that will be the other uh, four, I think it's in alphabetic order, alphabetical order holdings on that record. Uh, the show more details button will stay active until you click it again. The other part of any search results page are the search facets. These are relevant subjects, um, authors or personal names um, mentioned in the record, series, um, and other like genre headings that um, in our search results. For those who catalog, you can tell that these entries are taken from various uh, tags like the 100 or the 1XX fields, uh, 6XX and 8XX if you are looking at series information. The number next to the name or topic are the number of records out of the total number. So in this example, out of 72, 16 of them have magic as a topical subject heading. If you click on the facet, the results are going to refresh and only show those records. You can click on that same uh, entry again to return to the original search results list. A more button may appear next to a facet type if there are more to view. It's usually only going to show, I believe, the top five. Um, and then in this example, if we clicked more next to genre, you will see there are definitely more than five genre form headings um, in our results. All right, so let's use what we've gone over so far in a live setting. 
So I'm pretty sure I already have my search results set. So you can see here I have my default search library set to Evergreen, Indiana. And then my preferred library to Thorntown. Let's say I want to change it to um, Adams Decatur. So I'm going to select that and see how it automatically uh, saved here. I'm going to make this a little bigger for you. Default search pane, I usually keep to keyword search because I can perform most of my searches um, there. And also that's usually what I want to use first. Uh, I personally prefer to have more than 10 results per page. So there's just a little bit of less scrolling. So I use 50 and I absolutely want to make sure I have the ability to exclude electronic resources. So let's go ahead and let's create one or two templates that we can use for future searches. I don't think I have any, oh, I do have one right now. But let's click reset and go back to keyword. So I'm going to do, let's just do a title and author search uh, for books. So I'm gonna change my format to all books. Let's do a title. And then I'm going to select add search row and change that to author. And then I want to sort it by, uh, let's say, let's sort it by title from here, from A to Z. And now that I have those set, I'm going to go into my search templates and save. So title, author, uh, And then save. And so if I go back, we can see that that is in bold because we have that. Now, if I were to select AV by actor, it's going to automatically change um, my uh, query to that template that I had made previously for to search all movies and television. Um, I selected author in my catalog field. And the, so now I can search for, um, let's say, Emma Stone, um, if I wanted to find titles with her name in them. Uh, let's, let's do, let's do a title. Let's reset and do a title search for Legend Born. So search. All right. So we have four results. We can see here we have some e-audio and e-book. So that tells me I forgot to exclude electronic resources. But since there's only four results, it's not as big of a deal in this example. So we have this first uh, copy. And we can see here we have this physical information. Um, we have a copy of a call number on here. And it's not necessarily going to be um, your preferred library's call number. If we look over here, we have 60 out of 71 items um, in the consortium that are available. And one of one items um, is available from Adams Decatur. And then we can also see here, there is a one hold on this record. Uh, let's say, let's change this to a Let's do, I want to see what happens when we do a subject heading and see what pops up in facets for, let's do Lego. Okay, of course we have books. We have 1,483 results. I'm going to go ahead and exclude. Uh, if, I, if I forgot to mention before, with these options, uh, if you select them after performing a search, you will have to click search again to uh, restart that search with that filter. Okay, so with facets, we have different authors, topics, genres, series, and names. So let's look at more topic subjects. Let's see, we can do library of things. Um, books or titles that have a title subject of good and evil. Let's look at superheroes. All right, so we went from that 14, I think it was 1480 search results down to 83. And then of course we can narrow it down even more if we wanted to. Um, let's say, now if we, let's sit, let's do one more search for, actually I'm gonna do this. So this is kind of a, 
a what is what I'm going to use are called search indexes. And this is just kind of a quick way to search both uh, different, both two catalog fields in a single uh, input field. So I'm going to use the index um, search indexes for title and author. So I'm going to look up Club Dead by Charlene Harris. So I have 10 results. And let's say I need to go back to my legend born results. So I'm going to go to recent searches and it's showing me my last 10. So I'm going to click on legend born. It's automatically going to reset and perform that search again. But this time we have that exclude electronic resources option. So those two e-resource records are now gone. So now that we've performed the search, um, we can um, look at the actual record. So when we actually click on a search result on the title of a search result. We are starting, we are looking at a specific bibliographic record. And remember that these are what describe the specific item in a specific format. So let's take a look at how our bib records are laid out. Uh, an option that we have is, not, is the hide show search form. Um, which is great to use because we know monitors come in all shapes and sizes and we need as much screen space as we can to view what needs to be seen. When we're looking at a bib record, we have the ability to hide the search form by clicking that hide search form button. Uh, this minimizes that section to give more space to the record summary and any tab we may be looking at like the item table or staff view. You can see that the button uh, changes to say show search form when it has been minimized. You can just click it again to bring it back if you need to perform another search or pull up a previous search from recent searches. The record summary is a brief look at the item's publication information. It's similar to the details that you see in your search results, but it's more specific to the record because the attached holdings and patron staff holds are located in a different area now. We can still see the title, author information, as well as an addition statement if there is one, and pub date. Again, we can see the title control number and database ID as well as who created the record and who it was last edited by. The bib call number is actually taken from a field in the mark record. Similar to the hide show search form option, we can minimize the record summary to give a little bit more real estate to the rest of the bib record. If you click on the little arrow pointing up, it's going to show less of the, um, the record summary. Some information will still be visible, but it narrows it down to just the title, addition, addition statement, and TCN. If you opened a bib record from search results that had more than one result, you can navigate between those results or records using the, um, the navigation pane. Start will take you to the first record listed in the search results. Previous will take you to the result before what you are currently viewing. If you are looking at the first search result, this is going to be grayed out. Next will take you to the next record. End will take you to the last record listed in the search results. And back to results will return you to the actual search results. Uh, these options will be grayed out if you access the record in a different way, like searching from uh, via the title control number or database ID, or if you clicked on a bookmark link um, that you have saved. There are a number of actions we can perform on a specific bib record, whether it's for cataloging purposes or circulation or other functions in Evergreen. Since these are utilized specifically for searching the catalog, uh, we're just going to briefly talk about them. Patron view will open the bib record in the OPAC. Um, I am fairly certain that these links will continue to take us to the OPAC even after um, our libraries uh, launch the Aspen discovery layer. 
place hold will start the process hold, uh, the hold process for a title or a part level hold. Add Holdings allows catalogers to add new items to their library branch or branches. It's going to open the Holdings Editor in a new tab. If your library uses the Serials module in Evergreen, you have the ability to manage your subscriptions and MFHDs from this dropdown. The Mark For menu uh, will mark that specific bib record for uh, holdings transfer, where you move your item from one record to another. You can transfer a title level hold from one record to another. Mark the record for overlay, which means it will be pasted over with a better record or you can also manage your conjoined items if your library uses that function. Other actions allow you to add the bib record to a record bucket or a carousel, upload a cover image using the cover art uploader, or view place orders using the acquisition, acquisitions module. Again, most of these functions are handled by specific areas of Evergreen or your, uh, your departments like cataloging or circulation. Staff view is where we can view a lot of information about the record in a, um, let's say, a person-friendly format, not necessarily cataloger-friendly, but everyone-friendly format. We have publication information, title, author, identifying information like ISBNs, series information, and subject or genre headings. Um, these links will allow you to perform a new search based on what you selected. So if you, let's say you're looking for the rest of the Legendborn uh, cycle books, you can click on this series title link and run a new search with that search type. So the item table, this is where all of the items that are attached to this bib record are visible in an easy to view grid. You could also kind of think of it like a spreadsheet. Each row represents a different item and the columns represent different information for each item. You can see the location for the item shows the short name of the owning library, call number, item notes. Um, the, if, the, uh, if the part is attached to the item, it'll appear here. Of course, we have the barcode, shelving location, a circ modifier. If the um, item is new and has age hold protection, a date is going to appear here. This is actually kind of a quick um, way you can tell whether or not the item still is um, protected is if there is, a, if there is no date here, that means that the age hold protection was either never added or it, the date has passed. And then of course we have active create date if it's holdable and the status. And there are other uh, columns we can choose from using the grid configuration option. Uh, these next tabs I'm going to talk about are used primarily by catalogers. Any staff can look at them and click on them, but it's likely only catalogers will actually or can actually use them. Mark edit is where catalogers can edit the mark record. It can be viewed in either a grid-like formation or in a flat text format. It's similar to using Notepad if you've ever uh, used that uh, application. Mark view is where staff can look at the mark record without editing it. Um, and while it probably isn't preferred by many of you, and especially now since we have that staff view option, we no longer um, really have to use the mark view to look at like series information or a summary of the item because we have that staff view now. So yay. Uh, record notes are a way for catalogers to leave notes for other catalogers in the consortium about this specific record. And remember when I mentioned parts at the beginning of the webinar, how they help distinguish um, elements from within the whole? Monograph parts is, um, this tab is where we actually manage those parts on each record. The last tab that catalogers and probably circulation staff um, in your library will use frequently is the holdings view. Um, this is similar to the items table. 
uh, except catalogers can now perform actions on the items in their libraries. The view holds tab lists holds placed by patrons or staff on that specific bibliographic record. From here, the holds may be canceled, suspended, activated, or retargeted. Um, this is hold management at the bib record level. And there are other areas in Evergreen where you can manage your local holds. Conjoining records allows patrons to lo locate materials which are cataloged in a collection of some sort from the individual item record and vice versa, where the individual components of the collection are identical to the materials on the individual item records. Um, this uh, in the past has been popular with binge boxes, binge boxes that um, are manually created um, in your library, kits, and read-along sets. Uh, conjoined items are primarily used in the patron view or OPAC. Uh, we can see this single record has a link to a larger or a main shelf where all of the other uh, staff picked binge boxes in this example are linked. This is similar, if not exactly the same, as the shelf browse search function, except there's no separate search because you've already done the search and are now, and are now looking at a particular bib record. Uh, staff have the ability to change the default view of a bibliographic record upon loading, uh, which means that the tab that you select will be what appears first when you open that bib record. To set a default view for a tab, you want to open the tab and then click the set default view button. Now, when you select a record to view, it's going to load that tab first. Uh, the button will turn light gray and become unclickable when viewing the set tab. Uh, it will become clickable if you select, if you go to any of the other tabs. And this can be changed, your default view can be changed at any time. When you load a bib record for the first time while logged in to, let's say, a new workstation, because these settings follow the workstation, not the user, your item table, along with other bib record tabs, have a lot of visible information. But we can change that, like all other functions in Evergreen, by customizing the column to show only what we really need to see. So we can go from this, where there's a lot of information that we may not necessarily need to see, to this. So when we click on the grid functions option, we get a menu that allows us to manage the columns, uh, how big the columns are, um, and save the settings. We can also print the list um, using the print full grid or even download a CSV copy of it. Uh, below those, we can also manage our columns from here. A green check uh, mark means that the um, column is visible, whereas an orange X means that it is disabled. Um, the column is not visible. If we click on that manage columns uh, option, the grid columns are going to open up in a new window. Um, in my opinion, this is probably the best way to at least first configure your columns because you can easily go through select and deselect um, while moving them up or down, um, making them first visible, which means it's going to appear at the far left of your screen. Um, last vis visible, we'll move them to the far right. And as you check and uncheck fields, you can use the move visible columns to top option uh, to move um, all of your selected columns to the top of the, to the list. All right, so let's do a live look. Let's go ahead and just go into here. All right, we have the staff view here. And if I were to, let's say, let's say I wanted to see what other fiction books are available um, that are set in North Carolina. So I'm going to select that. And so now we have almost 2,000 uh, records to look through. But let's go back. All right, so item table, this is what we want to look at. So I'm going to 
reset. So this is what de by default will appear in our item table. There's just a lot of information we don't necessarily need to see, like total cert count. While it could be useful um, for day-to-day -day operations, it might not really need be needed. So I'm going to go to manage columns and let's see. So I want to remove the due date, last circ date, total circ count. Let's say keep all those. So I don't need to, so if we do that, then I can move visible. It's going to move that column to the top, but I don't really want that. Um, but I'm happy with the that now. And so let's change the widths a little because we know that some of these columns don't change widths, like the barcode. There's always going to be um, the same number of digits. The location is going um, basically always going to be, if not just a teeny bit difference um, of the size of the letters. Um, so we might want to add a little more for the shelving location if uh, to give a little more information there. Circulation modifier, at least books, you know, they're a little smaller, but then you come with like circ mods that are like transiting video disc and things like that. Um, so we can change those that way. Um, any changes you make though, always select save grid settings um, to save those changes that you made. Baskets, they're so cool. So baskets are temporary bins where we can store bibliographic records. They allow us to place a hold on multiple records at once, add the records to a record bucket. We can export the records into a file um, and print record details for future reference. So if we want to add records to a basket uh, in our search results, we will want to check mark those records um, that we want to add. And as we add the records to the basket, the number next to that little basket icon is going to increase to match the number of records that have been selected. You can perform multiple searches and add those records to the same basket. Just don't leave the catalog for an extended period, period of time or log out because your basket will empty. If you need to do something else in Evergreen, either finish using the basket or open your new activity in a new tab. If you want to add all of your results to a basket, you can use the Add All Search Results option from the Basket Actions menu to add them in bulk without having to check mark each result. If you want to look at all of the records you've added to a basket, you can either click on the little basket icon or go to basket actions and select view basket. Your basket will appear as if you were looking at another list of search results, except in this screen, your facets will not appear. You can place holds on specific titles from here, as well as remove titles from your basket. Instead of performing multiple searches and placing a hold on each individual record, you can use the basket to place a hold on all selected records at once. When your records are in the basket and you're ready to place holds, click on basket actions and then place hold. You'll be able to still see all of the titles with a hold pending status. When you've entered the patron data and click place hold, each title will, uh, listed will process the hold and tell you if the hold succeeded or failed. And remember, there is a limit to 30 holds per patron account. Outreach is 50. We have the ability to print our basket contents in a list format. Uh, from the basket actions, we are just going to click print title details. If you have Hatch installed, it should automatically print to your default printer like it did earlier when I was trying to test it. And then I will let you know now that the in the uh, staff catalog, the email title details does not work. It does work in the OPAC though, which is um, probably the more important 
option. So patients can still email title information to themselves. Add basket to bucket. Um, records that have been added to a basket may be added to a record bucket, whether it's for merging duplicate records by a cataloger or to keep track of records with libraries holdings. Uh, with your records in the basket, we click on basket actions and then add basket to bucket. The add to bucket function will allow us to add those records to an existing bucket, create a new bucket on the fly and add those records, or um, possibly add them to a shared bucket. Staff also have the ability to export records in batch directly from the catalog using a basket. Um, under basket actions, we will click export records link. This is going to take us to the mark batch import export tool to export the records to a downloadable file. Uh, this will likely be used by catalogers if they need to uh, perform a batch edit or if they are doing something else with the records. Um, I have used this in the past when exporting records to then re-import them into the training server. Last but not least is clear basket. It's going to remove all of the records from the basket. It does not ask to confirm. It will just do. All right, let's search. Let's do some basket stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna go cataloging. I wrote down some titles. So let's, I, I have well over a hundred books on my list of books to read. Um, so I'm just going to kind of treat this as let's, I'm gonna make a bucket of all of the items I want to read. You can probably compare our record buckets to the lists that patients have access to in the OPAC. Um, so while you might not be able to edit the records as a cataloger or as a circulation staff, you can still, you might still be able to use it to um, keep track of records or place holds from there. So let's say, I'm gonna do that. Oh my gosh. Let's see, I've been wanting to read Legendborn. I'm going to exclude electronic resources and search again. So I'm going to select that and see how it increased there. Check that big. Okay. And then let's do, I've already read this, but I haven't read the newest book. So, but let's say I want to listen to this. So I'm going to select the audiobook version. Okay, this was, I mean, I've read this, but it's a very good series, so I'm using it as an example. Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. Let's see, that new, okay, last one, that new House of Flame and Shadow book by Sarah J. Moss has been released. So I'm going to search for that. Okay, there. Okay, so now we have four items in our basket. If we click on the icon, it's going to show our list. It's the same as if we were to select view basket. Um, we could go ahead and place a hold, which will allow us to attempt a title level hold on these items. I'm thinking I'll probably get an error for this because it's so new. Uh, let's say, let's do one more. Uh, let's do Cats Adams because I don't want thousands and thousands of results to add to my basket. Come on. Last one. <laughs> well, there's the thousands and thousands. Let's just say uh, we'll add this one um, or select all and it's gonna automatically add all of those to that. Or if we wanna select all of those, we'll set add all search results, but that will probably take a while because uh, that is such a large number. So if we view basket, it'll show all of those titles. Um, we can uncheck it and you can see how it decreases. Get rid of the ones that we don't actually want like ebook those will probably be filtered out anyway. 
add basket to bucket. So if we create a new bucket on the fly, question, will Aspen change staff side of the catalog or just the patron side? Just the patron side. The staff catalog, anything in the web client, will nothing will change in the web client itself. And patrons will still have access to the OPAC um, if they choose, if they go to that link. Um, because if you remember the, let's this is the example of the consortium level uh, Aspen. It's a completely different link. So the OPAC will still be available like that Evergreen Indiana app. That's also going to be a, a still available. Thank you guys. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.